and I hear everyone asking, what about Diffie-Hellman? If you look at the lecture notes for public key crypto, you'll see we missed a few slides on something called Diffie-Hellman and other public key ciphers. So we covered RSA for public key cryptography. There are other algorithms. One that we'll cover later is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So that's in the slides we've skipped over. We'll come back to that when we look at how to exchange keys, key management. So we see that public key cryptography is used in encrypting data. It's especially used in authentication and key management as well. So we'll return to public key crypto soon. But this next topic is, signifies a shift in, in what we're trying to cover with cryptography. We'll talk about message authentication codes, but first, some, some common or general types of attacks on communications in a network. And we've seen these, although with slightly different names, in, in one of our first lectures in the semester. The general attacks, message disclosure. That is, I send a message, and I don't want anyone else to see the contents, but an attack discloses the contents of those messages, that message. That's bad. And how do we stop that? Encrypt the message. Okay, so that's the, the technique to prevent disclosure is encryption. So if you encrypt the message, if you're using a strong algorithm, one that doesn't have flaws, and you do it correctly, then it should be impossible for someone to find the original message, even if they can intercept the communications because they need the key to decrypt. Okay, so we've gone through symmetric key ciphers and public key ciphers for encrypting messages. In practice, encrypting data, large amounts of data, is primarily performed using symmetric key ciphers, not public key ciphers. There are some performance reasons for public key ciphers don't work fast enough for large amounts of data. So we have a technique to prevent this disclosure. Now, maybe this is not complete. This is not complete. Traffic analysis. We haven't talked much about traffic analysis. We send our encrypted messages, but someone tries to observe the patterns of communications. We haven't really touched upon techniques for dealing with that, and we won't, in fact. Some Using encryption helps, but you need to do more than encryption to prevent traffic analysis. And sometimes it's hard, but things like uh, adding extra uh, padding to your data, adding in random messages such that when someone analyzes the messages, they don't see any pattern in your behavior. So we haven't touched much upon traffic analysis, but there are techniques that can deal with it. But let's look at some of the other attacks. Masquerade. I am Tanarak, okay? I come here, I say, I'm Tanarak. Well, how do you know I'm not? So you need some way to authenticate the person you're communicating with. So masquerade attack is to pretend to be someone else. Other attacks, all right. So how do we stop a masquerade attack? We need to perform some form of authentication. Really authenticate the source confirm that the source that we're communicating or who sent us a message, confirm that they are who's that, who they say they are. Content modification. I send a message, someone intercepts, modifies the message, and then forwards it onto the intended destination. How does the destination know that the message they received has not been modified? We use authentication. Similar modifications. They don't modify the message, but they modify the ordering of messages. Let's say we send five messages, one, two, three, four, five, and the ordering has significance, such as the attacker changes the ordering of the messages in which they're delivered at the destination. How do we detect that at the destination? Authentication. And similar delaying and changing the timing at which messages are received, timing modification, we use authentication to do that. So, we're making a shift from encrypting our data 
to keep it secret, to avoid disclosure of the data. That's what we've focused on so far. We're now going to look at authentication and different forms of authentication. And some specific forms of authentication will be the last two. Repudiation. Remember, non-repudiation is the service that we want to make sure that no one can deny their communications. So source and destination repudiation. So the source cannot deny that they sent a message and the destination cannot deny that they've received a message. There are some two services that we often require. And we'll see a special case of authentication, what we refer to as digital signatures are used there. So this topic and the next, I think, one or two topics talk about different techniques for authentication. Uh, so generally, authentication. The receiver wants to verify that what they receive is authentic. What does that mean? We often break it into two, two parts. We want to make sure that the message has not been modified. Someone sends us a message, the one I received, I want to make sure that no one's modified it along the way. So data authentication. Authenticate the data in the message. The other form is that we want to make sure that the message came from the person who uh, they, they are claiming to be. I receive a message from and it says in the, the from address that it's from this person, from Tanarak at sit.tuact.h. When I receive it, I want to be sure that it is from Dr. Tanarak, it's not from someone pretending to be him. So, authenticate the source. Slightly different aims, but in most cases the similar techniques are used to implement data and source authentication. So we often mix them. Okay. We usually will have one technique that provides both. So what are the dif different authentication approaches? And we'll go through them. Pub uh, symmetric key encryption. Encrypt our message. So we'll explain how that provides a form of authentication. Turns out using encryption sometimes is not what we want because A, we may not want to encrypt the message and B, the algorithms that we have available may not be appropriate, may be too slow uh, too costly. So there are some other specific techniques that don't necessarily encrypt the data but also provide authentication. So we'll look today at message authentication codes, MACs. Don't confuse with an Apple computer or a medium access control uh, or if you've sat in on some of my other classes Mandatory access control. This MAC uh, abbreviation is used for many different things. Here we refer to message authentication codes. So we'll talk about what they are. Hash functions are important for authentication. And we'll use hash functions. Everyone knows hash functions? So hands up if you don't. That means that we will skip that and you'll be able to answer questions in the exam about hash functions. Good. And we'll see how hash functions are used in public key encryption and get to digital signatures. Those two, hash functions and public key encryption, will be in the next set of slides. First, let's see how we use our our known techniques for encryption to provide also authentication. So symmetric key encryption specifically. This figure, I've got a message. I want to send from A on the left to B on the right. Normal way to encrypt the message, I take the message, I use an a symmetric key cipher, E. I use a shared secret key, K. I encrypt the message, I get some ciphertext. The ciphertext is sent across the, the communications medium and the destination decrypts using the decryption form of the algorithm 
and using the same shared secret key to get the message. Okay, that's known. That's how we encrypt our data. It provides confidentiality in that only B can decrypt the message. Someone who intercepts the ciphertext, so someone who intercepts the communications between A and B, even though they have the ciphertext, so long as we're using an appropriate algorithm, they can't find the original message because they don't have the key. Okay, so you need the key to get the message. Therefore, the message it can only be seen by B. Only B can decrypt. Well, A can also decrypt, but A had the message at the start anyway. Okay, so A and B know the contents of the message. No one else in the world knows the contents. But that's not authentication, that's confidentiality, that's preventing disclosure of the messages. We want authentication. Well, it turns out this also provides authentication. B receives the, the ciphertext. B wants to make sure, in terms of source authentication, this message came from A. So B receives a ciphertext, they need to be sure it came from A and not someone else pretending to be A. So when B decrypts using key K, if it decrypts successfully, it means the ciphertext was encrypted using this key. And the only other person who has this key is A. Therefore, the message must have come from A unless B sent the message to himself. Unlikely. So it turns out, using symmetric key ciphers, we also can confirm that this message come from the other person that has the shared secret key. If... Let's see if we've got a few more slides to explain that. I oh, will explain it with a f the slides. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Similar with data authentication. If the message decrypts, decrypts successfully. When I say decrypt now, I mean that when we decrypt the ciphertext, we get plain text that is correct, corresponds to the original plain text. If it decrypts successfully, it means the ciphertext I received must have been encrypted with the shared secret key that A also has and that is the source authentication and that hasn't been modified because if the ciphertext was modified in some way it would not decrypt successfully so it also provides data authentication that is we can be sure that the message hasn't changed along the way It provides these two forms of authentication under the assumption that the person decrypting can recognize the correct plaintext or that they are sure that the, or that the decryption works successfully. So how do they do that? So we'll re cover these two again and, and consider this assumption. Here's an example. I want you to answer the two questions. So B, you are B, okay? You are user B. I've just sent you a message. You've received something. And here's the ciphertext you received. D, P, N, D, D. You think it's from A, okay? You think it's from A, therefore you decrypt that ciphertext using the key that you've shared with A. Let's call that key K. So K is the key that B has shared with A. Decrypting this ciphertext produces this plaintext. Do you think the plaintext is correct? Yes, maybe. So one, someone said yes, some people say yes, some maybe. Anyone know? Well, it doesn't look incorrect. Uh, The messages that we send have some meaning. Okay? No one 
sends random messages to people. Because if you're sending random messages, then you're not communicating any information. So with a message that we receive, when we decrypt and get the plain text, that message must make sense. Now, what makes sense? Well, it depends upon the context of the communications. In this case, I think you would assume that this makes sense. In the context of the communications, this is a valid plain text. What if we used a different key? Well, we've seen, and we've seen in some of our classical ciphers, remember when we did the brute force attack on the Caesar cipher? We tried all 26 keys. Very simple cipher. One of the keys produced some English message. The 25 other keys produced some random looking characters. And that's the, prop the property that we'll uh, assume that exists with our ciphers. When we decrypt using the wrong key, we take our ciphertext, decrypt with a key which is not the correct one that was encrypted with, we'll get random looking ciphertext. In this case we didn't, we got some structured, sorry, random looking plain text. Here we got some structured plain text, therefore it's reasonable to assume that because this ciphertext decrypts to this plain text that makes sense, then it means this must have been the original plain text, and it means this is the correct key. Who else has this key? A and B are the only ones who have this key. It's a shared secret key between A and B. Therefore, when B decrypts with this key, unless B sent the message to himself, it must have come from A. So it performs source authentication. Only A has that key, therefore only A can encrypt the plain text to get this ciphertext. Therefore, when we decrypt this ciphertext with that key and get the original plain text, we confirm it came from A. So we'd expect, in, well we'd assume in this case because the plain text makes sense, it was encrypted with the key K and hence therefore came from user A. Therefore we know who it came from. What about if it was modified? Same concept. If we sent some ciphertext from user A but someone intercepted and tried to modify that ciphertext and then B receives the modified ciphertext and tries to decrypt with key K, it's very unlikely to get some plain text message. If we try and decrypt the modified ciphertext with the key, we'd get random output. Since we didn't, didn't get random output, it means this message hasn't been modified. So it implies that the ciphertext received is the same as what A sent, which is data authentication. <coughs> same concept, different example. You receive this ciphertext, U or B, you decrypt with the key that we will share with A, and you get this plain text. What's your conclusion? Plain text is plain text is these characters here. This F T U. What can you conclude when you get that plain text? So you've decrypted some ciphertext with a key that you shared with user A. You think this came from A? Can you make some conclusion here? It's been modified. Something's been modified is one possible thing. Why do you say that? Because this, this doesn't make sense. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that the plain text that you get doesn't make sense. So you think something's gone wrong. If I decrypt ciphertext with the correct key, I should get plain text that makes sense. But I didn't. That implies either someone modified the ciphertext along the way, 
because if it was modified, when I decrypt with a key, I'll get something other than the original plain text, or I'm using the wrong key. Here's the ciphertext. I'm using the key shared with A. But maybe what happened is that user C created this ciphertext using their other key, their key. But I think it came from A, so I decrypt with the key shared with A, but I get something that doesn't make sense, so now I conclude it's possibly came from someone pretending to be A. It's not from A. I don't know which one went wrong. It's possible that either the ciphertext was modified or it came from someone else using the wrong key. In either case, I don't trust it. Okay? So we know something went wrong. Either the source is not authentic or the data is not authentic. In both cases, we don't trust that. And it's because the plain text doesn't make sense. Whereas in this one, the plain text made sense and therefore we trust it because it must have come from A and not been modified. Unfortunately, not all of our messages we send in the internet or in, in communications are nice, easy English messages. Sometimes we send images and so on, binary. What's the outcome? What's your conclusion? Can anyone conclude? Here's the cipher text you received. You decrypt with this key and you get this plain text. What's your conclusion when you get this plain text? Are they the same? Look closely. They're not the, the same type, yeah, but uh, so someone sent you an image. All right, this is a portion of an image. You don't know. That's the right conclusion in this case. That so far we're saying to authenticate we need to be able to recognize the plain text. In this case, I can. In this case, I recognize it's not English. And it doesn't make any sense in any other languages you may know. This one, well, binary, well, what are we looking for here? The point is that we must be able to identify some structure in the plain text. Even if it's not English, there must be some structure that we can identify to be able to confirm that this is the correct plain text. In this case, we could. The structure is that there are words in the English language that combine together to make a phrase that makes sense. In this case, there's no, no such structure. In this one, I don't know. So in general, to authenticate, we need to make sure that the plain text has some structure that the receiver will recognize. So this is just a summary of those examples. Example one, we concluded that it was sent by A and had not been modified. Example two, because it had no structure in the plain text, we concluded it either was not sent by A or it was modified. Therefore, don't trust it. Example three, I can't visually recognize any structure. So we don't know whether it's correct or incorrect. Which leads us to the point that whenever we send a message, we must ensure that the receiver can, can recognize some structure. We must make sure that there is structure in the plain text. If your plain text is English or some language, then the, usually you can recognize structure and there are ways to, to check the structure. But we'd like to automatically do it. That is, we'd like a computer program, when it decrypts, to be able to confirm yes, correct, no, incorrect. How do we do that? 
Well, if our plain text doesn't have structure that we can automatically do that, we can add some structure. Add some extra information to the original plain text such that when we decrypt, we can use that extra information to check if it's correct. And there are different ways to do that. Some things are built in. For example, if our message is actually a, a network packet, like a TCP segment, TCP segments have some structure in the header. They have fields which are always uh, present, so we can use that to recognize. So some things have structure present. If they don't, we add some structure like an error detecting code or a frame check sequence. And you have seen these in different uh, computer applications. Add some extra bits such that when we get the plain text, we can use those extra bits to confirm that this plain text is indeed the original plain text. Parity checks, a very simple form of an error detecting code. Uh, you would have heard of CRC, CRC 16, CRC 32 as, as an error detecting code for uh, computer data. And there are other ways to do that. So we'll assume from now on that there is a way to recognize the plain text. We'll come back to this. We'll make this assumption. Whenever we decrypt something, we can recognize whether we have the correct plain text or whether we have the incorrect plain text. We'll assume there's always a way to do that. And it's practical to assume that. You've used OpenSSL and DES and some other ciphers to encrypt. Let's just encrypt something, uh, just to give an example. I have some plain text message. It's 72 bytes in length, this plain text message. Let's encrypt it. And <laughs> encrypt with, let's just say, DES. The input is the plain text. And the output is my ciphertext. Sorry, it's wrapped a lot uh, across the line. But I just named the output. Sorry, the screen is not. Using OpenSSL encrypt using the cipher DES ECB mode. Input plain text is the file plaintext.txt. Output cipher text is the file ct1.bin. I haven't supplied a key or an initialization vector. We can, but in fact, OpenSSL will actually prompt me for a password if I don't. And I need to enter it twice. So if I make a mistake typing the password, it will tell me that. And it encrypts. So if you don't supply a key with OpenSSL, it will ask you for a password. And it uses that password to generate a key. And the algorithm for doing that is not so important for us. Uh, not at this stage yet. How long is the ciphertext going to be? How many bytes in the ciphertext? The plain text was this message. It was 72 bytes long. When we encrypt with DES ECB, what do you think the ciphertext is going to be in length? 32? No. Well, 72 bytes of plain text in. <coughs> What are we going to get as an output in length? Give you a, a choice. Less than 72, the same as 72, or more than 72? More than. All right, let's go to the answer. It's not going to be less than. Now, remember with block cipher, DES is a block cipher. DES takes 64 bits in of plain text. 
produces 64 bits of ciphertext. Now with a, a mode of operation, ECB, that's how it takes 64 bits and gets the next 60 or 64 bits of ciphertext and then another 64 bits of plain text and 64 bits of ciphertext. So at least the ciphertext length is going to be at least the same length as the plain text because we have the same length input, same length output. So it's not going to be less than 72. It's going to be 72 or more. Why would it be more? Padding. Okay. Or, or different reasons, in fact. If our input is not a multiple of 64 bits, the DES always takes 64 bits in, 64 bits is 8 bytes. So if, if it was not a multiple of 8 bytes plain text, then we need to pad that extra <coughs> last few bytes of the plain text to make it 8 bytes. Is it a multiple of 64 bits? 72 bytes in? How many blocks? Sixty-four bits is one block, eight bytes, one block. Our plain text is seventy-two bytes. How many blocks? Nine. Seventy-two bytes of plain text, one byte. Oh, sorry. Seventy-two bytes of plain text, eight bytes is one block. Therefore, we have nine blocks. Nine blocks. An even number of blocks, so we don't need padding. Let's see how long the ciphertext is. 96 bytes. Let's have a look at the ciphertext. Of course, I cannot open it in a text editor because it's going to be random characters. So I need a, a hexadecimal uh, display. XXD will display it. Just a program to display the content in hex. There's the ciphertext. It's got some salt in it. Okay? It's a salted password that was used. So, let's explain what happened. 72 bytes input, 96 bytes in the ciphertext. Where, where do these extra 24 bytes come from? They come from three different things. Firstly, I used a password and the password is used to generate a key. Remember, DES takes a key as in input, but I used a password. This salted is, of course, readable by anyone, and it's actually the first eight characters here. It's a special uh, string to indicate to the one decrypting that this was obtained using a password. If I used a key, this would not be here. Okay, this is to say that when you decrypt, you need to ask the user for a password. And we may not cover it until the end of the course. The way that you store passwords is you don't store the password, you actually store almost an encrypted form of the password using some other value called a salt. The next eight bytes, and again it won't make sense to you, but these eight bytes are for storing the password. For, for supporting the use of the password. So the first eight bytes indicate that we use a password. The next eight bytes are to support the use of the password. So we had 96 bytes minus 16. That leaves us with 80 bytes. But the, cipher t the plain text was 72 bytes. We've got 80 bytes. What are the last eight bytes? So, to summarize so far, plain text 72 bytes. We expect the ciphertext to be 72 bytes. Okay, the ciphertext is 72 bytes, plus eight bytes of this salted string, plus eight bytes to support the password. 72 plus 8 plus 8 is 88 bytes. 
But there's another 8 bytes to bring us to 96. And it d OpenSSL added some structure to the plain text. It added an e what we call an error detecting code. So that when OpenSSL decrypts, it can automatically detect whether it's correct or not. So it doesn't depend upon whether the plain text is English, an image, or whatever. When OpenSSL decrypts, if the message was modified, or if the wrong key was used, it will automatically use the, what's called the error detecting code, those last eight bytes, to detect if it's correct or not. Let me decrypt. And it prompts for the password. Why? Because when I decrypt, it recognizes these first eight bytes mean you must use a password, not a key. I type in my password. What's it say? Bad decrypt. Some error message. It didn't work. Can we look at the plain text? I don't know if it even produces. There's the plain text from decrypting. This is the plain text. What happened? I entered the wrong password. So what happened? I tried to decrypt the ciphertext. It prompted me for the password. I typed in the wrong password. And OpenSSL decrypts using that password, but then checks the structure automatically. It detects using the error detecting code if this is correct or not and it says no bad decrypt didn't work it just doesn't do any analysis of the english it just uses the error detecting code to automatically check that this is incorrect plain text and in fact we can see that this is incorrect plain text if i decrypt again but use the correct password. It doesn't report an error message. And we've got the correct plain text. So in practice, encryption software usually adds some error detecting code such that when someone decrypts it, they can, it can be automatically detected if this is correct or not. So that was an example when I entered the wrong password of the source authentication working. If I enter the wrong password to decrypt, it means I'm not the person with the original password. Or the wrong key has been used. So. With symmetric key encryption, we actually, the focus is on confidentiality, but we also provide authentication. We can confirm who sent it, and we can confirm that the message hasn't been modified. Any questions on so far with symmetric key encryption? Again, we're trying to make sure that everything's authentic. Nothing's been changed. No one's masquerading as someone else. Any questions? If, if we don't add the password, we'll have just 80 bytes. Yes, correct. Correct. With, so you don't need to use a password. Normally, you'd use the actual 64-bit uh, uh, key, an initialization vector. And we'd take the 72 bytes of plain text, encrypt to get 72 bytes of ciphertext, 
plus there's this eight bytes for the error detecting code. Yes, so OpenSSL automatically adds these eight extra bytes so we can check when we decrypt. There are other ways to authenticate. The problem with, with using encryption is that we need to encrypt the entire message. Let's say I have a, a, a 40 gigabyte file. Okay, I want to uh, transfer the file to someone. I don't want it to be secret. Okay. I don't mind if someone sees the contents, but I want to make sure, or the person that receives the file wants to make sure it hasn't been modified and it came from the correct source. They want to be able to authenticate that what they receive is valid. We don't care if someone sees the contents. So encrypting the entire file is wasteful in this case. It takes time to encrypt. Encrypting a 40 gigabyte file would take, I don't know, uh, minutes possibly. So often we don't want to encrypt the entire content. So there are other ways that can provide authentication. We'll look at message authentication codes. What we do is that we take our message, M, that we want to send to someone. We have a shared secret key. So both A and B have this shared secret key, K. And we use some function, some other algorithm, called a MAC function. And the terminology is a bit confusing here, but it's often just called a MAC function. But some algorithm that takes the message and the key and produces a short, a small fixed length output, T in this case. Now, also called a message authentication code, but maybe to avoid that confusion, let's call it a tag, sometimes called a tag. So we take our message, apply this function with a shared secret key K, and the output is some tag T. Now, this is similar to encryption. Let's try and remind you the algorithm for encryption. When we encrypt, we say we take, we have user A and sending to user B. Encrypting, what do we do? We take, let's say K, shared between A and B, a shared secret key between A and B, and we take our message and we encrypt using that key our message. And what do we get as output? Ciphertext. All right, message, sometimes we write P. P for plain text, message, M for message, same thing. That's normal encryption, symmetric key encryption. And we send the ciphertext. And we've just seen that that works for authentication. And we send that to B. That's the previous one. C is sent, B decrypts. But now we're using a different approach. We take our MAC function, some other algorithm, a shared secret key, I don't know, also K, A, B, the message, and we get a tag as an output. So A has a message to send to B, they take the message, a key, a secret that's shared between A and B, and some algorithm, I generically call this MAC, same as here, the encryption algorithm is E, and it produces some output. First, look at the similarities here. Message is input, message is input, shared secret key is input, shared secret key is input. So this, they both, techniques take the same inputs. What's the difference then? 
Well, the difference is in the algorithms used here. They have different characteristics, different properties. And one noticeable thing is that with encryption, the ciphertext as output is the same size as our input, plus maybe some error detecting code. But with a Mac, the output tag is small and fixed length. So that's the difference of how the algorithms work. So T is not the same size as M. T is small and fixed in length. And depending upon the algorithm as to what the size is, let's say 128 bits, maybe the length of T. If our message with encryption is 40 gigabytes, using encryption, the ciphertext is 40 gigabytes. With a Mac, if our message is 40 gigabytes, the tag produces output maybe, say, 128 bits. So there's, although they look the same in the way that we write them, uh, they are operating differently. We send the message and the tag to B, the destination. And I'll write it as message concatenated with the tag. That is, we take the original message and then attach to the end of that the tag that we've generated and send that to B. And then B needs to authenticate. That is, they need to go through the steps to verify that this message came from A and that hasn't been modified. And we'll see how that works in a moment. So this is one way we use a message authentication code, a MAC. First, no confidentiality here. Anyone can see the contents of M. So if someone intercepts here, they can see M. We're not trying to keep the message secret. That's not our objective. If it was, using this approach is wrong. So here we're just trying to make sure that B can verify it came from us and that it hasn't been changed. So we send the message in, in, in the clear, we say, as well as the tag. Whereas when we use symmetric key encryption, the message was secret. So there's a different uh, in features there. What does B do? When we used encryption, what did B do? They simply decrypted. They, let's write it as they take their decryption algorithm the same shared secret key. So this was the procedure we used before, the ciphertext, and they get... I write M prime as the output. B thinks it came from A, therefore decrypts the ciphertext with the key shared with A, and they get some output, M prime. And if this makes sense, then they trust what they've received, and it's authentic. That's the pre previous approach. What do we do with the tag and message authentication code? How do we authenticate? We take the message we received and we calculate the MAC for that. Using the shared secret key KAB 
and I'll explain Mac M prime in a moment. Why did I write M prime here instead of M? I'm trying to distinguish. A has the original message M. They send it across the network. Maybe someone modified it. Okay, it's possible that someone, the attacker, tried to modify it. So to distinguish from the one that was sent and the one that's received by B, I'll say the one received by B is M prime. It should be the same as M. They should be identical. But in some cases, they may not be. So M prime just means this is the received version. So what B does is they take the received message, they think it came from A, so they apply the same MAC function that A used using the shared secret key KAB, and they get as an output another tag. T prime, we'll write it as. And then what? Then they do a check. If, you can think of it, if the calculated tag, T prime, equals the received tag, everything's okay. That's the concept there. So we're first going through the, the process that we use to use the MAC and, and, and the tags. And then we'll see how it provides the security. So B receives a message along with the tag. B calculates the MAC of that received message using a shared secret key with A, and they get some calculated tag as output. And it should be the same as the received tag, T. If it is, then we assume everything's okay. If it's not, we assume something's gone wrong. We don't trust it. So we need to look at the properties required of the function such that that works, that it provides authentication. Any questions so far? What about if the attacker modifies the... So we, we, we would need to look. What if the attacker... What, what possible things the attacker can do to do an attack. And one thing may be to modify T. So we'll see that the attacker, if they modify the tag, let, we'll, I'll draw it a bit later and we'll see on some slides, but if we modify the tag, then what B does is they calculate the MAC of the message received, they get some tag, they compare it to mo the modified tag and they will be different. We'll see the properties of our MAC function should be such that the MAC of two different messages will give different tags. Let's re go to that property and then see why that attack won't work. We'll return to that picture in a moment. The tag, I don't know if it's on the slide here, The same with encryption. When we encrypt a message with two different keys, we'll get two different ciphertext. Or if we encrypt two different messages with the same key, we'll get two different ciphertext. So if we vary one of the inputs, we'll get a different output. The same property is in the case with a Mac. If we use a key and one message, we'll get one tag. If we use the same key in a different message, we'll get a different tag. That's the required property of the MAC function. Similarly, if we have the message the same, but use two different keys, we'll get two different tags. And the concepts are similar to a hash function. I think you may know from some data structures, a hash function takes some large arbitrary size input and tries to map it to some unique small value. And this is using a similar concept. We take a large, potentially large message and produce a unique tag as an output.
let's go back to that diagram and see why that's the if that property holds what an attacker can do so our requirements we say with our MAC function has the properties that Let's try and summarize. This is the, rec the properties required for our function, the MAC function. And there are different MAC functions, but they need to have this property. That is, if we take the MAC of some message M1 with key K1 and get tag T1 and then modify the key but use the same message, the MAC with key K2 and message M1, we should get a different tag. That's the required property. Two different keys input, two different tags output. Similar, if we modify the message, same key, sorry, the first and the third. K1, K1, M1, M2, two different tags as output. That's what we require of the MAC function. If it doesn't have those properties, then it will not provide the security that we need it to do. So we need to find a function that has those properties. And there are different functions that do that. Uh, we'll see some examples later, and we'll see some more when we look at hash functions. So there's similarities to hash functions. The hash of two different values produces a different hash value. So if these properties hold, two different keys, different tag, two different messages, different tag, then what can an attacker do? Let's try an attack. And there are several approaches. So again, A, sending a message to B. So A takes the message and calculates the tag. And sends it to B. But our attacker intercepts. C is the attacker. They intercept what was sent. Sorry, we missed. What is sent? M and concatenated with the tag T. So we'll see what happens if we try and attack. A has a message wants to send a B, so they calculate the tag using the MAC function and the key shared between A and B. They send the message and the tag to B, but our attacker C intercepts. And they try and modify something. So they intercept and send to B but a modified value. <coughs> what
what do they send to B? Let's see if they modify the message. What can the, the attacker C try and do? I know there are some malicious people in this classroom, so try and give me a, an answer of what a malicious person would try to do to try and defeat the authentication system here. What are you going to try and do? Just try something. Let's see, we'll try something and then see if it works as an attack. You had one before, what was it? Modify T. Modify T. Okay. If we change T, what happens? Come back to that one. Let's say we modify the tag and we send M and some other tag, T prime. What does B do? Well, B follows the same steps always. It takes the message received, calculates the MAC, and compares to the tag. So B calculates the MAC using KAB of M and then they compare that with the receive tag. Let's say that they get a value which is called, let's denote it as T subscript C, meaning the calculated T value, just to keep them separate. B receives the message, thinks it's from A, therefore uses key shared with A, KAB, calculates the max, MAC of that message and gets a calculated value TC. And now they compare TC to T prime. Are they the same? So the process at B to verify the message, calculate the MAC of the message, compare the tag calculated with the tag received. We received T prime, we calculated and got TC. Does TC equal T prime? Look. How was T prime calculated? T prime is the received value, or sorry, T prime is the modified value. TC was calculated using a different value. So the, if it's a modified tag, if T prime is not the same as T, then T prime is not the same as TC. TC is the same as T. Yeah. Same input, same output. MAC of K, A, B and M. MAC of K, A, B and M. T equals T, C. But if we say that C modified T to get T prime, then T prime is not the same as T, and therefore T prime is not the same as T, C. And if they're not equal, something's gone wrong. They must be equal to be authentic. So. In fact, this is not a very good attack because it's not trying to achieve anything. We'll try a better one in a moment. That is, B would detect that this message he received is not valid. It does not verify. Let's go back and try a, a, a different attack. What else can the attacker do? Change both. 
All right, that's one, correct? We'll do that in a moment. We'll do a simpler one first. Let's just cha change the message. The message is increase C salary by, uh, sorry, decrease Steve's salary by 10,000 baht. I'm C, the malicious person. I intercept and I change the message to increase my salary by 10,000 baht. And I send that modified message on to B, the, the accountant who updates the payroll. So we modify the message, denote it as M prime, where M prime is different from M. And keep the same tag. So all I do is change the message, the contents of the message, use the same tag as before. B goes through the steps to verify. So B calculates the MAC using which key? What key do I use? If you're B and you think the message came from A, you use the key shared between A and B. So we denote as key AB. If I thought the message came from C, I would use the key shared with C. And the message I receive is M prime. And we get a value, let's call it T prime. And now we compare T prime, the calculated value, with the received value. Do they match? So B just always goes through these steps to verify. Mac of the received message with a shared key, compare it to the received tag. Go back to the properties of our Mac. Uh, I've got it where? I'll just go back for a bit. These, these are the properties of the Mac function. Remember, th if we take one message and use two different keys, we'll get two different tags. If we take one, so the MAC with key 1 and M1 produces one tag. The MAC with the same key but a different message produces a different tag. That's the requirement of our function. Similar, if we use two different keys but the same message, we'll get two different tags. So always rem remember those properties of our function. If the inputs are different, then we get a different tag. That's a simple way. Now let's go back to what our attacker did. T prime is the MAC of K, A, B, and M prime. T, the received value, is the MAC of K, A, B, and M, where M prime is different from M because we modified the message. That was the attack. Therefore, the tags are different. If the two messages are different, even if the key is the same, the tags will be different. And therefore, B detects that this is an attack and doesn't trust the message. So by mo modifying the message, the attack is unsuccessful because B verifies it. They don't know what the correct message is, is just checking that it's authentic or not. And in this, ca this case, it's not. The last attack. Modify the tag didn't help. Modifying the message didn't help. Let's try and change them both. Actually, I'll leave that to you. Let's just try a slightly different one. Just in the last few minutes. Uh, let's do a masquerade attack. C 
sends a message to B pretending to be A. C sends a message to, to B saying, here's a message, it comes from A. B receives the message and verifies. And to verify the same steps, the MAC with a key of the message received, and we get some, let's say, some calculated tag, and then we compare the calculated value with the received value. And if they're, correct, if they're the same, authentic. If not, don't trust it. So, this attack, C is masquerading as A. They send a message, a tag. When B receives the message and tries to verify, they apply the MAC function on the message with some key. What key? What key? What's the subscript? B thinks the message came from A. So that this is uh, the attack from C. They're pretending to be A. They don't know it came from C. It's from A. The from address says A. Therefore, if it comes from A, to verify, use the key that you shared with A. The key that A and B share is KAB. Same as we had before. We think it's from A, therefore use the key that we shared with A. And we get some tag, and we compare it to the tag received. Do they match? Under what conditions would they match? Well, what is, how was T calculated? T was calculated from the message by C. Let's look at how C calculated the tag. T was calculated as the MAC using a key of that message M. As in the normal procedure, C calculated a tag using the MAC function on the message and a key, which key? Or, yeah, correct. Which key didn't they use? They didn't use KAB because they can't know KAB because KAB is shared between A and B. No one else must know that. Otherwise, it's not a secret. So let's say they call, used, I don't know, KCB. They cannot use KAB. Let's say you, they use a different key. T is the MAC of M with KCB. TC is the MAC of M with KAB. Two different keys, two different tags, therefore not equal, therefore we detect that something's gone wrong. So in this case, if C wants to masquerade as A, to trick B, they need to know the key shared between A and B. But our assumption is for any secret value, no one else can know it. If it's a secret between A and B, C cannot know the value. If they do, then they can defeat this system. But if they do, then uh, we have other problems. So C cannot pretend to be A because if they try to, B would detect it because the tag would not match the expected value. So if the tags don't match, we don't trust what we received. If they match, we trust it. We haven't said anything about what is the MAC function other than stating some properties. 
There are different algorithms that can be implemented here that provide the properties. On Thursday, we'll look at some different algorithms, just as some examples, but they're available and usually quite secure. Uh, and the benefit is, compared to using encryption, we're not encrypting the entire message, and in fact our MAC functions often can be faster than the encryption functions. So performance is a benefit here. The message is not confidential. There's no aim to keep it secret, so anyone can see the message, it's just authentication. What you can do is see what happens Again, put on your malicious user uh, suit and try to, be pre to pretend to be an attacker and see what you can modify and then see what happens at B when they try and verify. And try all the combinations and you should then understand why it works, why the properties are important and why the authentication is successful. Any questions to finish off today? There's no other way to attack this? Find out. I think we've covered all of the, well, all but one cases. So we've covered the case of pretend to be some user, and the previous ones covered the case of modify the tag, not successful. Modify just the message, not successful. The other one, modify the message and recalculate the tag. See if that's successful. And I think that's the only combinations you can try. So yes, it's secure. So long as our MAC function has those properties that we stated. Okay? If it doesn't have those properties, then we have a problem. Let's continue Thursday. We'll look at summarize the properties and then we'll look at other forms for authentication.